In this episode, my friend Wayne Jett sits down with me and we discuss the 100-year plan going back to the early 1900s. Now, we're a little behind, but if you understand what's going on in this time period of history, you can clearly see that what's going on today in 2022 is nothing more than a continuation of that 100-year plan. Now, we had fun and I hope you enjoy listening. Thank you. Welcome to the Banking with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery, and I'm as excited as I can be. I'm always excited when we have guests on, but we have our friend Wayne Jett back with us. It's been a while since he has, uh, has uh, been with us, and so I'm excited to have him here. Look, Wayne Jett is uh, an author. His book you can see in the video um, on him, on his side, The Fruits of Graph. Great Depression's in and now. He's an, a, an attorney. He's uh, argued for the Supreme Court. He's um, r- really a, uh, an economist as well. Um, very well-rounded, very intelligent, very articulate, and it's always a joy to have him, and I'm sure that you're going to enjoy our conversation, so welcome. Welcome, Wayne. How have you been, sir? Very well. Thank you, James. Uh, as well as can be, I suppose, in, in today's circumstances, but uh, the country's struggling, but uh, uh, we can put it in some perspective, I think, today from uh, what we've uh, learned about the past and what I was able to uh, learn in researching my book, the one that I didn't want to write, uh, the one that I stayed away from until uh, it got to the point that I stuck my nose into research and found enough that I couldn't uh, I couldn't deny it and uh, decided to go the whole thing. And it it frankly took me six years, I think, to write my book. Uh, at the same time, trying to look for a, a publisher that would be suitable. Um, I found one publisher willing to publish it, uh, but it was going to be paperback only with advertising in it. And I just didn't think, uh, in all due respect to that publisher, and his courage in terms of covering uh, important subjects. Uh, I didn't think that was the kind of book I wanted to have. And so I, I published it myself and I did so um, in a very high quality design. I got the best uh, printer in the country, I believe. And um, they put it together with a sewn bound binding. So at last generations, it doesn't come apart uh, when the paste or glue melts uh, or gets brittle. And so uh, uh, I hope it is, uh, well, I frankly uh, uh, have uh, achieved something that I never thought I could in writing the book, uh, giving it the importance that it deserves. Uh, my book has been uh, rated uh, number six all time among more than 2,000 books rated by the great, uh, by the most prolific reviewer of nonfiction in America in the world, as far as I know. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, that gentleman uh, rated it number six all time among more than 2,000 he had reviewed. And uh, wound up get, uh, signing it seven stars, his highest rating uh, that was done uh, for only 25 books that he had, had uh, reviewed. Uh, books that he concluded uh, were transformative, life changing. And I think this is the kind of thing that uh, what, he, what it means is that uh, in the fruits of grafts, we find out we've been lied to uh, by so-called all the important people in our country. Uh, The so-called great scholars and academicians of the Ivy League schools. Uh, They've lied to us about economics, about economic theory. They've lied to us about history of what has been done in our country, about the uh, motives and the practices and the actions of our most revered presidents, uh, two of them uh, named Roosevelt, both of whom are lauded and both of whom did uh, great, great harm and damage to the American people that they profess to uh, lead and, and love. And so uh, I'd, I'd be delighted to go through some of those things in more detail with you, 
uh, I'd be happy to do that if that's what you'd like to do at this point. It is. It, I would love for you to do that. You know, I appreciate you writing the book. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, and I, I'd like to know, uh, share an idea of how many publishers you had to go through to get to the one publisher. And then, then I mean, because that is really telling on the content of the book, you know, so... Number one, thank you for doing the work. How many publishers did you go through before you found the one that uh, was pretty noncommittal to me? So no disrespect to the publisher, but you know I well, agree with you. It's hard to say. I, it's hard to say I went through publishers oh. because when you don't get a response from them, uh, it's hard to say you went through them. Oh, okay. Uh, you might have contacted, uh, but uh, nobody's interested in, in reading the uh, manuscript. Uh, nobody wants to talk about the kind of subject that you can summarize. Uh, and uh, it's clear why uh, my research uh, clearly determined that that uh, uh, was a determined objective announced uh, in 1901. And one of the things that one of the books that I talk about in my book, uh, the plan was to make sure that publishers are controlled. Uh, there had been a very important book uh, published, self-published, by the way, initially uh, in uh, 1879 uh, by a man that uh, that uh, really was a, a tremendous contributor to our understanding, Henry George. Uh, I had never heard of him until... Uh, I placed my hand on a book, uh, on the book written by him in my public library, uh, even though I had uh, been you know, through uh, high school, through college and so forth. So on, I, I was not familiar with this man, Henry George. Uh, he was actually a publisher of a small town, relatively small town newspaper in California uh, in the 1870s. And uh, he had gone to New York City to uh, set up a wire service to serve his newspaper in California uh, so he could get news from the East publishing this uh, paper. And uh, while he was there, he wrote later that he had the experience of, uh, of being astonished at what the dire poverty there was in, a, in, a, in of all places, right next to the richest people in the country right next to the Wall Street, New York City, downtown area. Uh, he found great poverty and it impressed him so much, he determined to find out how that could be and why. And uh, he wound up writing a, a book called uh, Wealth and Poverty. Uh, Progress, I'm sorry, Progress and Poverty is the name of the book. Uh, he self-published it in 1879. Uh, it is so well written that it just uh, uh, you know falls into your mind, you might say, uh, that uh, his logic, his expression uh, is so well presented. I can see why it sold more books than any book in history in the world uh, on an economic subject. And es essentially, uh, he set out to explain why we have such stark poverty right face to face with the most uh, extreme wealth uh, in the country. And uh, what he, uh, in just a few words, uh, more or less, uh, what he found was that uh, there had been a practice among the elite, the, the, the powerful rich class, that they would plan in advance the location of cities in the new world. Uh, they would uh, cast their net out and, and plan together where they were going to build their next city and things of that sort. And they would buy all the land there uh, at uh, uh, pennies on the dollar because it's wilderness. And uh, they would lock up all the land holdings and then they would start the progress of putting in the railroad and putting in this and that and so forth in order to make that land valuable. And uh, one of their tenets of operation was they would make sure that they did not sell the land, that the people who came out there to be in the new cities would have to rent, uh, would have to be their tenants. 
uh, would have to be their servants and so forth, uh, not the landowners, uh, until such times as, as uh, the land, of course, made them wealth, made, made them even wealthier. Um, he, he discovered those circumstances and started reporting it. And uh, he went through and showed how he, he laid out a proposal for a complete revision of the tax system in the country that would eliminate poverty, would have only a single tax, and it would be the tax on undeveloped land equal to the rental value of it. Uh, with a tax like that, it would cause all of those rich people to sell the land rather than hold it. And out of that tax, they could uh, support the entire government and uh, everyone else could be tax free. And the ordinary common people could uh, prosper and, uh, and uh, really become the kind of class that we now know as the middle class. Um, the middle class was not so prevalent then, but it was uh, certainly trying to get the, the, the foothold in the country uh, to uh, become more prosperous. And uh, that was the circumstance in which he wrote that book. And with that single tax proposal, it basically hit the world like a, a barnstorm and he sold... Uh, over 2 million copies in 20 years uh, between 1880 and 1900. Uh, that still holds the record as the best-selling book on economics ever written. And uh, it, it uh, well deserved it. It uh, is a very uh, enlightening book to read, uh, forthright, understandable, and makes perfect sense. Uh, but it struck right at the heart of uh, how the ruling class uh, rules and uh, threatened their uh, continuing to do what they want to do. Well, uh, that book contained a particularly important paragraph right toward the end, the last chapter, last few pages. Uh, in which Henry George said something different in, uh, in addition. He said, uh, there is a powerful pecuniary force that writes laws and molds thoughts in every nation. And he went on to say that uh, when powerful men speak about it, they speak in hushed tones. Uh, that... Uh, it is something that uh, cannot be talked about out in the open without uh, having a threat to, to your livelihood or existence. And so um, it basically sounded that small alarm right at the end that uh, to me is all important in uh, teaching us where we've been since 1880 and where we are now. Uh, it is uh, uh, that powerful pecuniary force that uh, is at play in the world of uh, 2022, uh, particularly in the United States of America right now, in Europe, uh, all over the world. Certainly, uh, Russia has had its problems uh, most, uh, most viciously attacked of any nation in the world by that cabal. Uh, and we can go into, I, you know, my book uh, goes into that in, in some detail, detailing exactly how it was that uh, um, we, for example, in America in 1913, uh, not long after, I mean, not long after the publication, but there, I, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because uh, there was another book written in 1901 before the 1913 debacle in which we created a, uh, a Rothschild bank to handle the currency of America. 
uh, to produce currency in America as opposed to uh, a gold-based money. And uh, that was a tragic uh, turn of events. No doubt about it that I'm certainly not the only one who has concluded that, but uh, it has put us in the grip of that powerful elite that Henry George spoke about uh, because, uh, in effect, they were given carte blanche to put out currency that was to take the place of money and they could print it uh, without audit and they could give it as much of it to themselves as they wished at any time and they would never be asked about it. Uh, that's been the problem that we've been dealing with for the 20th century and this, the part of the 21st century that that we've lived through so far. And uh, um, I might at this point uh, get to the 1901 book that uh, is also a, a substantial, significant landmark in the literature of this this problem it was written by an unknown englishman at the time the only thing he had written prior was uh, science fiction and and horror stories uh, but hg wells uh, was put on the map as a an intellectual uh, by a book that he wrote called uh, the short title of it is anticipations uh, but uh, it has actually a long scholarly title um, that makes it sound very academic. But uh, we call it Anticipations. And what he did in that book is sort of the opposite of what uh, Henry George had done. Uh, he started off with a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, an extremely boring chapter or section on uh, how it is that towns get put together and cities get to put together and things of that sort. And uh, it is so boring uh, and uh, leading nowhere that you say, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't need to read this thing anymore. Uh, let's just move on to something else that's worthwhile. Uh, but then uh, in the second section, uh, about a third of the way into the book, all of a sudden, uh, the subject becomes very, very different. And uh, that different subject is that he simply takes a direct, straightforward uh, hold on the, uh, the torch of uh, carrying the torch for the ruling elite and what they're going to have to do to get back the power that they're entitled to have because the middle class has become uh, a direct and growing threat to their continued rule over the world. That in fact, uh, unless the ruling elite take, takes hold and uh, begins to uh, really uh, progress in a plan to destroy the middle class completely, uh, they would lose power forever and uh, never be able to get it back. And so uh, in a very direct English language, from that point on, the book uh, continues to say, this is what we've got to do in order to destroy the middle class. We're going to have to destroy the entire society of America uh, and Europe as well so that the middle class can be extinguished. Otherwise, it can't be done. So we have to tear apart society completely and destroy it in order for us to get back our ruling position. Uh, and in order to summarize that uh, quite a bit, um, he uh, winds up, well, he provides some things that they need to do, for example, as a uh, control all publishers. 
for example, uh, own the banks, for example, uh, own the central banks that provide all the money or the currency, uh, control all of that. But uh, when we get down to it, the plan was to be in a position by the year 2000 they need to learn how to poison all of the people of the abyss. Uh, that is not a matter of simply putting them in their place. Many, many, many millions of people the world over need to be dead and need to be poisoned. And uh, it seems to me with that kind of language and uh, and purpose and objective, it seems to be fairly straightforward that when they said by the year 2000, in other words, 100 years out from now, we hope to be able to know how to poison uh, the people we don't want. Uh, it's not a matter of knowing what is poison or finding a poison. And, and you're thinking about it, it, it seems to be somewhat logical that uh, the challenge was not so much to find the poison, it was to find a way to get people to take it. And uh, I think uh, we can sort of leave that out there at this point as a uh, reference to the kind of recent experience we've had uh, in America and the world over. Uh, it's been a little past the year 2000, but. Uh, We've had problems uh, back to that time, and certainly we have them in 2020 and 2022 and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, that was the, the book that was written by H.G. Wells and which got him uh, an almost immediate, well, pretty much immediate invitation to all the palaces of Europe. Uh, the ruling elite there, but it also in 1901 uh, got him a an immediate invitation to the White House of Theodore Roosevelt as the honored guest at a reception for him. And he came on the arm of a, a woman who uh, was to become the uh, founder of Planned Parenthood and uh, the so-called abortion mill that uh, we have come to experience. Um, and uh, when H.G. Wells left that reception in his honor, uh, he quoted to the public that uh, I've just met with the human demigod of whom I have dreamed, that is uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So. Apparently, he felt that Theodore was uh, quite a, uh, an able and uh, energetic champion of the cause that he had just expressed in that book, Anticipations. Um, uh, last time I looked, Theodore Roosevelt is still on the mountainside in uh, uh, the uh, pantheon of edifices up in South Dakota yep. and uh, so that is the kind of history we've had now have, have our scholars have our Harvard uh, uh, academic leaders uh, told us about this I would say they've done the opposite uh, they've uh, hidden these kind of motives, they've hidden these kind of purposes. They've uh, not spoken of, of this objective uh, announced and uh, trumpeted around the world by H.G. Wells in 1901. Uh, they haven't spoken about it at all. Uh, they've had the same kind of mysterious explanations, for example, for the crisis of 1929. Uh, which was and is reported in the fruits of graft as being a a planned attack on the market uh, what what is called now a naked short selling is what they did then to crash the market 
uh, the big players. Uh, it wasn't uh, economic conditions. It wasn't the dollar. Uh, they didn't want the dollar to be the problem for the uh, for the uh, great crash. The dollar, as administered by the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the Rothschild Bank. Uh, the uh, the whole matter about uh, what was going on in the Great Crash was a planned crash. Naked short selling, selling shares you don't own and millions of shares all on a, on a signal that was understood by the big players. Uh, that signal had been planned in a conference over in Europe of the big players. And uh, one of those was uh, the man named Bernard Baruch, a yep. uh, big investor, of course. And uh, he later explained that uh, he had been vacationing in Europe and then shooting grouse in Scotland. And uh, out there shooting grouse, all of a sudden, he said, uh, something came over him that he should return to the United States immediately and sell his stocks. Just, uh, you know, some kind of revelation in that open, natural place that uh, inspired him that he should do that. Well, he wasn't the only one who did it. For example, the, uh, the board chairman and the largest stockholder in Chase Bank. The largest country, uh, the largest bank in the country at that time, also came back and uh, sold. Uh, I forget exactly how many shares he sold, but I think a million shares of uh, Chase Bank. He sold short against the box. In other words, uh, there were shares that he had, but he didn't let go of his shares. He kept them because he never wanted to sell them, but he did want to sell them at a high price that he could then buy back later at uh, a covering price. Um, that came out in, in uh, interviews by the Senate uh, back in the early 30s when they had some hearings on that. Uh, but uh, somehow it never gets uh, much play in the history books written by our academic elite. Uh, so... Uh, that is one reason, for example, that in 1939, a man who was, uh, had been one of the bankers for the ruling elite in Europe uh, was uh, imprisoned by uh, Stalin in the Soviet Union and was questioned on... Uh, with uh, truth serums and things of that sort, make sure that he was lucid and able to express what he had in mind, as opposed to simply being scared to death because he had been sentenced to death. Um, he described the crisis of 1929 as the most important revolutionary event in the 20th century. So it wasn't the October Revolution in Russia that was the most important revolutionary event. It was the crash of 29 that he felt was the most important because to the ruling elite, it had a more substantial effect in putting them where they wanted to be in, in terms of uh, is their move toward uh, returning to rule uh, the world over on a global basis without the middle class intervening and uh, getting in the way. Uh, so that's kind of a, um, a, a fast and direct approach toward explaining the kinds of things that have affected the world up through now. The, the, the uh, the poisoning or uh, of 1917, the uh, flu influenza oh, yeah. of 1917 was one of the things. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in my book was uh, 
a piece of correspondence between uh, one of the big foundations and President Wilson uh, telling him to make certain that uh, the war, World War I, doesn't end too soon because, uh, in effect, they were just at the, uh, he didn't say because, but he just said to make sure it doesn't end too soon. Uh, the reason was uh, they wanted to be sure and be able to get the influenza out into Europe and across Europe and, uh, and the world to kill as many people as possible before the war ended. Um, and so they uh, spread the, uh, the affliction, whatever we want to call it, of the virus uh, through our troops that were being uh, uh, shipped from Kansas to Europe and uh, to Spain, in fact, where they uh, spread the virus further. And then it uh, became worldwide and uh, killing um, tens of millions of people uh, over and above what the war was killing. Uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of history that unfortunately we have to deal with. And um, I think uh, the Fruits of Graft deals with it in such a way as to be straightforward enough to be understood and to be uh, documented enough in footnotes and uh, specific re references and so forth uh, to allow the reader to check it for themselves. And um, it's the kind of thing that uh, we ought to expect from authors every time they write. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the opposite uh, is the case. And the opposite is the case still, because as a part of the plan and of H.G. Wells, uh, the publishers had to be controlled. We can't have books coming out from just anywhere and everywhere. And, uh, and certainly the uh, people of the big institutions, the ones who get uh, the professorships and so forth and the lauding of uh, tremendous reputations and selling millions of books and make them as thick as possible and so forth, uh, sell them by the pound uh, without telling you anything. Um, uh, it's amazing that you can write a book that thick and never get around to what uh, you can really say is the explanation of why the Great Depression happened. But uh, um, my book gets around to that, and uh, in some respects, it's pretty straightforward. After the crash, uh, Hoover did absolutely nothing uh, to uh, stop the fraudulent trading. The fraudulent trading didn't end with the, with the crash. It kept on while Hoover was in office. He did nothing to uh, stop it or slow it even though I think it was apparent to many in the market that that's, uh, it was crooked trading that did it. Um, but, uh, and those, uh, uh, those circumstances, uh, instead of doing something about the crooked trading, Hoover did exactly the worst thing possible, uh, two of them, which was to sign the uh, High Tariff Act, uh, increasing tariffs so high that it shut down world trade by 70% in the first year. Um, and he also, in his last year in office, 1932, quadrupled the lowest tax rate and trebled the highest tax rate from about 25% to nearly 75%. Uh, now, if that is not a death wish by a guy running for president again on the part of Hoover, I don't know what is. And I think that is explained uh, that he was simply handling, handing the baton to Roosevelt. 
partly by uh, one of the items that I ran across that uh, surprised me, certainly uh, in the research, as a number of other things did, is that uh, Hoover himself had become quite prominent as a world-class engineer uh, during the, uh, the teens and had, uh, on the Panama Canal and other projects. He had gained such respect that he had been brought home and put in charge of providing food to Europe. And so he had gained more prominence. And Hoover was actually interested in running for president in uh, uh, 1920 to succeed Wilson. Uh, and of all things, which is the surprising part in particular, uh, he's reported to have approached FDR, the Democrat governor of New York and a prominent figure already, approached FDR to run as his vice president on the ticket. Um, FDR, for whatever reason, uh, declined and Hoover did not run that year. Uh, but uh, uh, he waited around and ran in 28 uh, after, uh, according to Calvin Coolidge, the president that was so successful during the 20s and cutting tax rates and uh, really being the first really good supply side president we had, Calvin Coolidge, uh, one of his uh, children, Coolidge's children was... Uh, died suddenly in the White House after playing tennis. I'm not sure what happened uh, to cause that death, but uh, for some reason, Coolidge, although he could have been reelected in the landslide, declined to run again, uh, which opened the door for Hoover uh, to run, uh, even though Coolidge at the time said, he's given me Seven years of uh, seven years of unsolicited advice, all of it bad. <laughs> so we have uh, Hoover stepping in, doing what he did. Nothing about the the uh, fraudulent uh, stock trading and uh, quadrupling the lowest rate and trebling the highest rate of income taxes. So, of course, he was going to be ushered out of office on a rail in the election of 1932, uh, providing the exact uh, opportunity for FDR to come in and uh, become a political darling. But, of course, uh, what I reveal in my book in more detail than we can go into today uh, is that he did uh, everything to make the Depression as hard and deep and uh, deathly on the common person as a, as a president could. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to uh, just mention a couple of those things because they, they uh, are so telling. Not only were they doing these st completely stupid things like when people were starving in this country, uh, pouring milk in the gutters to supposedly get the price up, killing baby pigs and burying the bodies so they would not grow into food animals to feed the people. Uh, and that would get the price up of pork. Um, well, let me tell you how he made sure that the price of pork was high. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry how the price of pork was low. Uh, the way he did that uh, was not only not reducing the price, the tremendous price increases that Hoover had signed, he got into office and, and uh, FDR immediately began increasing tax rates even higher and adding new taxes uh, that had not been uh, present before. Um. And so tax rates went up, not down, when he took office, after he took office his first two terms. Actually, they went up uh, every year except 39 when 
the Democrats had lost uh, 83 seats in Congress and uh, wouldn't raise taxes that year. Uh, but um, in order to uh, make sure there was no money in the country for people to buy food, uh, he uh, he increased the reserves required of small banks, the ones that serve the middle class out in the country, the ones that serve the farmers. He increased the uh, reserves required by 50%. And then uh, another six months or so later, he increased them by another 50%. As soon as he took over at the Fed with more appointees, and his, the Fed was doing exactly what he wanted, uh, they increased the reserve requirements of small banks, the ones who loaned to farmers and loaned to grocery stores and loaned to small businesses and things of that sort. He increased the reserve requirements so high that there was no money to lend to them. There was no money to finance farmers. Um, so the food uh, stores and, and crops and so forth were drastically hurt. And, uh, um, and then he did something that uh, still is unreported by the so-called uh, academic press. Uh, that is, uh, supposedly as far as the historians report, he dabbled in gold, buying gold on the open market. Well, uh, let me tell you what I uh, learned in my research and report in my book. Uh, he didn't just uh, buy a few little gold pieces on open market here and there. Uh, he was uh, buying gold uh, on the world market in uh, tremendous amounts. And he was doing it with his increased taxes and he was doing it with government bond sales into the into the country with people having uh, lost their businesses and re recovering whatever capital they could uh, wanting to try to invest in something safe that they wouldn't lose it they were buying government bonds and what was he doing with the money that he was taking out of the private economy and government bonds he was spending it to secretly buy gold and store it at Fort Knox and preventing the Federal Reserve from monetizing the gold yeah. as was required under the gold standard. You have to monetize any gold you have in order to make sure that wherever the gold flows, there's enough money there for the economy to prosper and therefore uh, assist the world nations in prospering as well. But he did the opposite. He took the money out in taxes and he took it out in the billions. And uh, I, my research learned that in his first eight years in office, when he took office, uh, we had a total of about uh, just a little over 6,000 tons of gold that we had accumulated in foreign trade in our entire history up to that time. The first eight years that he was in office, FDR Roosevelt bought more than 13,000 metric tons of gold, and he did it with money straight out of the economy that he did not allow to be replaced by the Fed. That's why nobody had any money in America. Everybody was starving that nobody had any money. You go to every town in America, they say, how are things here? Nobody's got any money. That's the phrase that I used to hear as a little boy. Um, so uh, this was a planned destruction of the middle class, part and parcel of the 1901 plan that Henry George, uh, not Henry George, I'm sorry, H.G. Uh, uh, well, Wells had written about. And uh, so we could go on and on. This is the kind of thing that our history uh, has been hidden from us. 
The same thing has been true uh, certainly since Roosevelt. Uh, the wars, uh, the wars that Americans have fought have been wars planned and contrived by this uh, global cabal that wanted uh, people to go and fight. Uh, they, uh, they got their, uh, they got their elitist uh, bank here in the United States from Woodrow Wilson, who broke his promise not to have an income tax and not to have a central bank, a private central bank. He broke both of those his first year in office. And uh, America has suffered for it ever since. Uh, we uh, are still living with the effects of it. And uh, I've been writing for some, some years that uh, the sooner the Fed is dead, the better. Uh, I think we're getting very close to that time and uh, look for that progress to be made uh, in the not distant future. May I pause to give you a sure. chance to say something? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and you know taking notes here. It's, uh, and you know, and I appreciate uh, you know the history lesson. And uh, so, no, and I'm all you look. The the 21st century has been the bloodiest of all centuries. You know, if you, the listener, anyone who wants to to like know the truth if they will honestly look at history without preconceived ideas and and if they have uh age like your book the fruits of graph um, it will paint a clear picture of what is going on today this is just a continuation of the 1901 plan it's the same book different chapter they're behind uh goal and and i think that they don't like that and they're not comfortable with that so they're ramping it up um but yeah so by all means continue and if we can get to the point where uh, i love your optimism that um if you think the time's approaching that the federal reserve would be ended i would be shocked you know so educate me on that um, well, it is at the point of failure. Uh, okay, uh, as we speak, um, I, I mean, I say that in the sense that uh, uh, other leading countries of the world have already stepped to the fore, and they've already uh, returned are returning to the gold standard. Uh, they've agreed to do that. Uh, they put in place. Uh, those nations are known as the BRICS nations. Uh, I happen to think that uh, uh, sooner uh, rather than later, there will be an American uh, uh, member of the BRICS. Uh, so we can call it the BRICS or something of that sort. Uh, but uh, I feel quite sure that uh, the good part of our country is on that path. And that uh, it's only the, the bad ones uh, controlled by those outside powerful forces, the globalist forces that have kept us uh, away from it so far. Uh, and they've done so with uh, some actions in our country that have been very hard to uh, uh, live with. And so we'll we'll see how matters go in terms of progress toward uh, getting us where we need to be. I think that uh, I, I'm optimistic that uh, that is going to occur. Uh, and uh, particularly so because I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm uh, pleased to see that there are other nations of the world that supposedly have been regarded by the propaganda as uh, laggards rather than leaders uh, are already out there in front making a clear path toward a gold-based currency, a gold-based gold money. Um, 
I, I just have to take a second to to reiterate uh, what we've said before as to why gold is important with money. It's not because it's so expensive <laughs> or it's not because it's so glittery or anything of the sort. It has a physical makeup uh, that gives it a very stable value, uh, stability in value, not sharply increasing value is the characteristic that gold has that makes it the measuring stick for money that works in economic and results in economic growth. Uh, if you have a currency or a money that changes value, it's highly detrimental to the uh, economic growth. If it increases in value, if the, if the money increases in value to any extent, uh, it causes the producers of goods and services to have to cut their prices in order to sell. If they cut their prices in order to sell, they go out of business. Um, that was clearly illustrated in the 1870s. After in 1871, after the so-called war was over, uh, the uh, Congress and Senate passed a law that said that the value of the greenback dollar that had been produced by uh, Lincoln during the war, uh, which had decreased the value of the dollar by about 50% from its gold standard. Uh, that 1871 law said the value of the dollar has to go back to the original value it was before the war. That means that it's got to increase by 50% or basically practically double in value in that next nine years. Well, as soon as they passed that law, the uh, United States of America dropped into the worst depression it had ever had to that point and, and probably worse than the one that we had in the 30, 1930s. Uh, at least uh, uh, businesses were going out of business. They were failing, uh, and they were failing because it that law required a deflation of the currency that is going back to a higher value. And when the value is increasing of your money, you have to cut your prices. That's why we had just a flood of, of uh, bankruptcies and businesses all over the country uh, that that nine years, uh, and uh, that was documented uh, as as being a very very sharp depression. But uh, amazingly, our University of Chicago professorships never got around to being able to say that was a deflation caused by that law. It's just unexplainable. Um, and uh, uh, and yet, it, it's clearly uh, the cause of it as the actions taken by Hoover and Roosevelt were clearly the cause of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, the one thing I uh, haven't uh, in my own mind come up with a clear enough explanation about is how did they do the dust storms? Um, those were events that were uh, uh, seemed to me to be technology based, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of production that uh, has not been duplicated since. And I don't know how we came up with dust storms that would put dust over statewide areas six inches deep when we've never had those since. Um, but nevertheless, uh, those were the kind of things that the people were put through in the United States by their own government with a president, by a president that uh, was supposedly loved and cherished and put back in office for four terms. Uh, it was uh, 
uh, a, a great, great deception to the American people, although many understood and simply never had a voice. It was the powers that be that have written the history books and uh, have misled and are still doing so. Uh, the big publishers are still just as bad as they ever have been. And so are the academics, I'm sorry to say. That, Can we say further? Uh, yeah, listen, I, that's the, uh, this is a first, um, you know, uh, comment or question or consideration of the Dust Bowl being partic- potentially man-made or, you know, technology-based. That's very interesting. Well, let um, me just mention in that regard, uh, that Dust Bowl situation uh, took place well after the events uh, of the 1890s and uh, the technological revelations of the great Nikola Tesla. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I think there was a great deal more technology uh, it's certainly reported now that the significance of the technology revealed in the 1890s by Tesla uh, was uh, so significant we haven't seen that progress revealed yet, but uh, reportedly we're about to, uh, not by the bad powers, but by the good. Uh, We've been kept in the kind of limited technology for reasons uh, that serve the globalists, uh, but not the well-being of of the people. Uh, And I think that uh, we may very well be. It's reported that we're near the point of overcoming the globalists and uh, and, uh, coming into this new age of actual real space exploration with great technology uh, that never actually was achieved back in the 1960s when we supposedly went to the moon and we can't do that anymore. Uh, I I, I tend to uh, see eye to eye with the reports that show that moon landing as having been filmed out in the desert of uh, Western America. Uh, so um, we have a lot more to learn and uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm eager for it to get on the road uh, soon. Uh, yeah. I would, you know, I would like, uh, I, I sincerely hope these, you know, the unnamed good people and the bad people, you know, uh, the bad people being the ruling elite and the cabal, that the uh, these quote unquote good people, Wayne. I hope that they uh, exist. Number one, and then I hope that they have a solid understanding of history and what is really going on behind the scenes. Um, that well, would- let me uh, I just stick my oar in the water one more time here <laughs> okay. and say that, uh, for example, uh, in nineteen thirteen. Uh, when the U.S. was saying yes, yes, yes to the uh, Rockefeller uh, uh, Rothschild Bank, Rothschild Bank, and so yeah. forth, uh, the Czar of Russia was saying no, no, no. Yes, uh, that resulted uh, not only in the war being World War One being commenced and fought largely on Russian territory, yep. with millions dying but also the overthrow of the czar and the assassination of him and his family. Yes. Uh, And uh, the imposition of the dictatorship on Russia that came to be known as communism, as if the Russians were communist people. No. They're Christian people. Yes. Uh, You might say the polar opposite of communists, the ones that, the communists uh, stamp out freedom and life and uh, free will and Christianity and Christian love and so forth and put everybody as desperate enemies of each other. And uh, to this day, the people who have gone into Russia 
uh, from Western Europe to look at the Christian circumstances there. Not only is there a higher percentage of Russians who are Christian than in America, uh, but uh, uh, a scholar from Western Europe, a woman who went into Russia in recent years to look at the Christian practices there, she says they're actually uh, quite uh, serious practitioners of Christianity. It's very appropriate in Russia to speak of Christian views and uh, and issues of uh, information uh, and faith uh, in social company and in social circumstances, while it seems to be uh, impolite in America to do so. Uh, now, I'm not making too much of that. There are serious Christians everywhere, uh, I'm sure, in America. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we need to recognize where our friends are in the world and uh, stop believing the propaganda that is run by uh, the presses, the fake news, and so forth of, uh, of Western media. And uh, the ones complete agreement. Yeah. You know, I, I'm glad you put your oar in the water. There, it's like uh, Putin uh, is reported to have said that Stalin ruined a thousand years of Russian heritage. You know, the uh, it was not a Russian revolution; it was a Bolshevik revolution. Period. So, and, uh, and the and the Bolsheviks were paid mercenaries. Financed by the Western banks, including those of Wall Street. Uh, yes, part of the 1901 plan. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. It's like you can you cannot have a world war without a world bank, a central bank. You know, and the yeah. World War One started within months of uh, the formation of the Federal Reserve. And, you know, so yeah. There's a lot. Even though we've covered a, a, a long time span here, there's a awful lot there in that time span that you know you can't cover in a, an hour we've been going about an hour you know you, you can't cover it um one book yeah. can't cover it but um your book i'm just saying for the viewer the listener the fruits of grass the great depressions in and now should be required reading if you want a true uh touchstone of history there there it is right so well, I appreciate that very much. I, uh, it concerns me. Uh, I, uh, I hope it's going to be available from now on. Um, there are certainly issues of uh, longevity and things of that sort that uh, uh, I'm the publisher and the uh, one who uh, almost does everything, including mailing the books. Uh, not quite. Uh, I, I use a service for that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, it uh, we we need to solve the problem uh, that the controlled publishers, the globalist publishers, are the same ones that supply our schools, um, and uh, uh, that is a problem that's going to have to be overcome. Uh, and to do that, we have to get past the thing of uh, this so-called scholarly freedom, the academics claim. Uh, they have been captured in their scholarly freedom by the globalists. And uh, we need to free academia of that in the United States and certainly uh, free our publishers so that they embrace truth and uh, uh, what is uh, the truth about what has been done to the people uh, rather than trying to, to uh, build up the uh, fraudulent uh, political careers that have uh, been in charge of so much of what has gone wrong in our country. All right. So you want to end it here? Is this, I, I think uh, you've given me all the time you uh, ought to, and uh, I deserve, I thank you so much for uh, asking me. I'm glad to talk with you anytime in your audience. And uh, there's certainly of course, a lot more that can be discussed uh, much more than we can do in any, any hour or, uh, multiples of it but that's why i wrote the book and i'm glad it's it's there for the record uh, i hope it stays uh, so and uh, i'd invite anyone to get their choice now classicalcapital.com 
uh, the buy book uh, page as the place to order it. Uh, it's right now limited. I've, I've got to improve it. Uh, you used to be able to uh, order multiple copies. Right now, the PayPal connection doesn't even permit that. So it's a uh, frustration, uh, but I'm uh, making it work as well as possible and trying to get uh, into position to uh, uh, do a new website that uh, actually works uh, better than the one I have now. But I'm glad to have anything. I, I, I uh, publish uh, intermittent reports of current events on the website. You can see those things now. I've got uh, one out just in the last few days uh, regarding current events. But uh, we'll not go into that now. And, and I, I thank you very much again. Uh, for uh, inviting me you're welcome wayne jet you're welcome anytime uh to come on as a guest i appreciate you i appreciate your work and we'll put the uh appropriate links in the notes so uh people can track you down and purchase your book which i highly encourage the listener the viewer to do that and uh we'd help in any way that we can in promoting your books your book and your well, thank uh, you james and merry christmas to you and your family and uh, god bless uh, all around and uh god bless our nation amen and the Thanks. world thank you wayne have a great day i appreciate you okay? you too thank you right. you bet bye-bye Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.